Hello and welcome back. Before I begin, I'd like to give a big thank you to Fernari874 and Nosebud for becoming my two latest subscribers. Thank you very much, I really appreciate your support. And I was going to say now on with the haul, but this is not really a haul per se. I decided to do something a little bit different, something I actually wish I had thought of doing before. Um, for the new year, I decided to do a little best of video. I'm calling this best of the backlist. This is going to feature books that you probably will not see on any other best of 2011 lists because they were not published in 2011. Some of them were published much, much earlier. Some of them not that much earlier. And um, I narrowed myself down to 10 just so it's not super frenetic or super long. And actually it's 11, but 11 for 2011, I suppose. Um, and I also tried to tailor them a little bit to what I think viewers' interests appear to be. Like, it looks like a lot of people are interested in my French books, and I seem to have a big um, science fiction fantasy contingent uh, that's interested in those. So these are not necessarily the 10 best books I read in 2011, but they are 10 that I thought were very good and worthy of notice, and also that I thought I could talk about intelligently and might have something new or interesting to say about. So without further ado, my first pick is the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini. This is not the most interesting looking um, edition out there, it's a Harvard Classics edition. And uh, Cellini was a great Renaissance sculptor, but his autobiography is hardly a staid work of art history. It, he basically spends all his time fencing, feuding, and having affairs with the ladies. And I honestly, I could not believe that they didn't make a Douglas Fairbanks senior silent film out of this. I mean, it's just swashbuckling and craziness and that he's, he's such, he's kind of a cat and a braggart, but it's just a really, really entertaining book. And if there are any benighted souls out there who still think that history is boring, I highly recommend that you read Cellini's autobiography and you will be swiftly disabused of that notion. And here we have another nonfiction. This is Bussy Rabutin's Histoire Amoureuse des Gaulle. And you may actually remember I included this in an earlier haul this year. So yes, I do actually read some of the books I bring home. Um, this was written in the 17th century. And this was almost a, um, I guess, a, an early version of what I think came to be known as Wienergate, which was this past year when now, former Representative Anthony Weiner tweeted a picture to someone that was meant to be private, and it wound up being public. And uh, Bussy Rabutin got in huge trouble because he wrote this series of sketches, which are um, really kind of nasty little um, essays about the sexual mores of the time among the aristocratic men and women he knew. And so he wrote these little sketches, and they, he gave them to a couple of friends, and they weren't meant to be public notice. And one of these so-called friends of his, of course, disseminated them everywhere. And the rumor mill got started, and there were rumors that he said nasty things about the king and the king's mother, when in fact he didn't. And he got in a whole lot of hot water over that. But um, besides the really interesting history behind it, this is just a fun, fun book, really witty and... I guess scabrous is maybe too harsh a word, but racy and just a lot of fun and a really interesting peek into the mores of the time. I highly recommend it. And I'm not sure if it's available in English, but I suspect it is. I don't know. I mean, why wouldn't it be? And now moving into the 18th century, my next pick is Charlotte Lennox's The Female Quixote. A lot of 18th century novels are... Um, really astute psychological portraits of women, like Daniel Defoe's Maul Flanders and Samuel Richardson's Clarissa, two of my favorite books. And this one is special because it's also an, a psychologically astute female portrait, but it happens to actually be written by a woman, imagine that. Um, this is a great story about a young woman named Arabella, who's an heiress of the time, and she grows up very sheltered and reading all of these basically romance novels, historical romances that uh, are not really all that historical in their content, that are very embroidered and uh, hyperbolic. And then her father dies 
and she has to make her way in society on her own. And all her notions of society and proper behavior are shaped by these romances she's been reading. And so she does not fit in at all with, the, with her contemporaries and winds up getting herself into a lot of trouble using words that are perfectly innocent in the context she means them but wind up being really offensive to who she's talking to. And she winds up pursued by this young man and she has to marry him to keep her fortune but she's determined not to. And um, it's about how she tries to get out of that. Uh, just really funny and also kind of sad at the same time. But very, very enjoyable. Highly recommend it. And now moving to 17th century, or, or I'm sorry, uh, end of 18th century into beginning of 19th century, I got The Travels of Mungo Park. This is a really nice little old Everyman's Library edition. And honestly, I picked it up just because it was Everyman's Library. I figured it was probably worth reading, and I had no idea who the heck Mungo Park was, but figured it would be interesting, and it wound up being great. Mungo Park was a Scottish doctor who was sent on an expedition to explore the River Niger in Africa in the um, late 18th century. And it's about his adventures there trying to chart out the, um, the territory and meet, meeting the uh, people living there and his observations of their customs and just the really incredible physical hardships he went through. Um, we take so much for granted in the 21st century and I think we often fail to realize just how much it is we know. I mean, we, we know pretty much every, you know, what, what is in every location on the globe. I mean, obviously there are still some places that are uncharted, but we pretty much know what's where, who's where. And at this time, they didn't know that. This guy was basically going blind into um, this rather dangerous environment. And his adventures are really breathtaking. And it's really a sad book because he, against all odds, comes back from his first voyage to his, his beloved wife, who's incredibly relieved to see him. And then he decides to set out again. And I don't want to give any spoilers, but it, well, I guess I can't avoid it. It doesn't really end so happily for him. Um, just a really fascinating book, highly recommended. And you also will learn the origin of the phrase mumbo jumbo if you read this. And now we're going to take a big leap into the 19th century with a novel, The Galab Lourdes, by M. Saltikov Shedrin. And this one, I believe it's now published as The Galab Lourdes Family. And you can get it through um, oh, what's it NYRB Classics. They put it out with, I believe that one has an introduction by James Wood, who's one of my favorite literary critics. But I have the trusty ancient Signet Classics edition. This is just a wonderful, bitter, little Russian family saga. And unlike a lot of Russian novels, it's really pretty short, um, which I can't say I complain about. Just the, the story of this family that starts out not really particularly nice to begin with, but winds up being just nasty and dissolute and pretty much doomed. Not really the world's happiest story, but um, really kind of funny in its way. Uh, highly recommend it, and it has reached the ranks of probably my, let me think, yeah, my top three Russian novels, which are uh, this one, Bulgakov's The Master of Margarita, and um, Goncharov's Avdomov. So, highly recommend it. And then, I don't read nearly enough poetry, but I did manage to read this New Poets of England and America, an anthology. It was edited by Donald Hall, Robert Pack, and Lewis Simpson. Um, this was published, oh, when was this published? Oh, darn. 1957. This was published in 1957. And um, I discovered a lot of really good poets in here, uh, like Donald Davey, Keith Douglas, people I'd sort of vaguely heard of, but I'd never read any of their work. Elizabeth Jennings, a lot of really good selections in here, and I highly recommend it if you can find it. And there's also a second series, which I, um, I have, but have not read yet. Maybe I'll get to that this year. And then I picked up An Amour Les Gommes, 
This is a novel by the screenwriter of Last Year at Marion God, which is one of my favorite films. I really enjoyed this. It's kind of an absurdist police procedural. I would describe it as Samuel Beckett meets Graham Greene. Really entertaining. And if you're looking for an English copy, it's translated as The Erasers. And I think you've heard me talk about this before, and I actually included it in one of my hauls. This is Deserted Cities of the Heart by Lewis Shiner. It's billed as sort of a fantasy, but it really is only has only the barest fantasy element. It's about um, a war in it, it's about um, civil war in Mexico, and a journalist and um, some other people who run down there and get involved with the revolutionaries. And there's a theme running through it of the Mayan apocalypse, but it's really not, it's not really heavy handed about that. But just a really great book, um, very original, and just also a great Gen X Lost Generation novel. I would say the one's on your shelf, shelf next to uh, Jay McInerney's Ransom or Alex Garland's The Beach. Highly recommended, and Lewis Shiner appears to have had rather a diverse literary career, and I'm looking forward to reading more of his fiction. And then I read my first Lucius Shepard novel, Trujillo. And Shepard is a really acclaimed um, science fiction fantasy writer. This is not his most acclaimed book, which would probably be either Green Eyes or Life During Wartime, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I would describe it as if you, as if you took a Jason Starr protagonist, although Jason Starr writes noir fiction, I've, I've mentioned him as one of my favorite noir writers. If you took one of his protagonists and threw him into an H.P. Lovecraft story, you might wind up with something close to this. Um, really enjoyable, beautiful, beautiful writing and evocative descriptions of scenery, and really a pretty creepy story. Um, highly recommended. And last but not least, this is where the sort of 11 instead of 10 comes in. I read the first two volumes in John Crowley's Egypt cycle. I read Egypt, which he apparently rewrote and retitled as The Solitudes. I have no idea how he rewrote it or what that's like. Someday in my dotage, I'll probably take a look. And the second book in the series, Love and Sleep. There are four books in the series, and I hope to get to the um, second two pretty soon. I really enjoyed these. They're kind of strange. I would almost describe them as Robertson Davies meets 30-something. Um, really interesting explorations of the occult and historiography mixed with just these people living kind of ordinary lives. Um, really interesting books, but not a lot happens in them. So if you're looking for some really bang-up adventure, I would say steer clear. But if you're just looking for something really strange and different, I would say go for it. And happy, happy new year to everyone. I hope it's a great one for all of us. And if you've made it this far, thanks for watching. And I hope you'll join me for my next video.